All right. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another great edition of the Frankie Slauson Show, and uh, welcome to another great uh, iconic interview on Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture, which is a summer series that I've been rolling with all summer long, and now that we're in uh, early July, I have with me a very talented uh, uh, cartoonist uh, and co-creator of the hit cartoon uh, Red and Stimpy, I have with me Mr. Bob Camp. How are you doing, Bob? I'm good. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great, uh, and, and uh, welcome to the show. This is a, a very uh, rare treat, I'd say. Oh, thanks. And uh, and uh, you've been uh, doing the... Well, how long have you been doing uh, or being a cartoonist? How long have you been one? Being a cartoonist, I, I used to draw when I was, like, tiny, like, you know, two or three I was drawing. Uh, but I've been drawing for a living as a cartoonist old enough to work since I was 16. Oh, wow. And it's always been kind of like a, a passion of yours, more or less? Uh, I don't know if it's a passion. I think it's it's just, you know, like breathing. It's just something I do, you know, something I've always done. It used to, used to be a passion when I was uh, a kid. I, you know, uh, I never did very well in school because I was always sitting in the back of a class just drawing and not paying attention, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but... Well, you know, uh, I yeah. I don't draw so much for fun anymore. You know, it's it's a it's a job. It's a living. I, I still enjoy it, but uh, uh, when, when I have spare time, I don't draw. I relax or do something else or do chores or whatever. But I'm pretty sure you're 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 proud that uh, that you've been able to accomplish so much. You know, and and uh, you know, I don't you know I, I don't really know how old you are because I never looked at your age. But uh, but the, the fact that you've been doing it for a long time. Uh, God's to make you proud that you've been able to just just do this as a living, more or less, rather than working anywhere else. Yeah, I, I think it, <clears throat> I was pretty lucky, you know, throughout my career. I sort of fell into different jobs. I started out as a caricature artist, working at Six Flags Over Texas when I was 16. I did that for a while and <clears throat> did portraits as well. And then I uh, traveled around um, all over the United States and Canada doing uh, portraits and caricatures. I lived in New Orleans for a while and did Cape Cod and followed the rodeo circuit, you know, did state fairs and home shows all over. Um, just, you know, moving around and sort of living out of a suitcase and uh, sort of living the fancy free life. And then I uh, ended up in Provincetown, Massachusetts and met a cartoonist named Gary Hallgren in uh, 80, 1980, I think, and uh, he uh, brought me to New York and introduced me to Larry Hama at Marvel, and that was my first sort of print job. I was a um, cartoonist for Crazy Magazine doing movie parodies. And cri- is, is that like a comic book series or something? Or? Crazy Magazine. It was a, a you know, it was a, a pretty good mad ripoff, like crack. Oh, okay. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that. Uh, I, I, I used to I used to collect the the Mad magazines and the Crack magazines back in the day. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then I sort of um, um, kind of grew into doing comic books. There, uh, I was working in the bullpen and doing uh, art corrections on the entire Marvel line. Um, you've heard of Romita's Raiders, John Romita's like corrections crew. Well, before they existed, it was me. Oh, wow. I did all the all the art corrections on all the books, which was great because I learned a lot of different styles. And, uh, I was lucky enough to be there while the original bullpen crew was still around, uh, and I learned a lot from those guys. And working for Larry was great. Uh, got to work on a lot of his books: Conan, the Nam, uh, GI Joe, uh, Bizarre Adventures, uh, you know, things like that, Savage Tales, different different cool sort of. Sword and sorcery books, war books, all the war books. I worked on those too. Oh wow! So you, you, I mean, even as a young guy, I mean, just kind of get your get your uh, career kind of started, you know, just doing all these uh, different uh, things. I mean, that, that that's pretty cool. I mean, I gotta say, uh, uh, just being able to do that uh, uh, alone is uh, pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I was lucky, and I sort of uh, did it out of necessity. It's funny, too, because I, I never was a comics fan. Uh, <laughs> I never read comics, but ended up doing them, you know. And uh, uh, I was, for a long time there, I was uh, inking John Buscema. Um, 
I inked a lot of Michael Golden stuff, did covers for the NAM, stuff like that. I got to work with a lot of really great artists. So, uh, who are some of your uh, I, like your uh, idols like uh, that kind of inspired you once you realized that you actually had a really good talent of cartoonist, or being a, a, a cartoon artist? Uh, who were some of your uh, 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 people that you were inspired by? Well, I think early, my when I was very young, I wanted to be an editorial cartoonist. I was a big fan of Thomas Nast, uh, the great editorial cartoonist, uh, who did all those great Tammany Hall cartoons and stuff. Uh, New York, you know, in, in the, not the last century, but, you know, the 19th century, uh, oh. into the 19th century. Uh, and, uh, of course... Harvey Kurtzman is is a big influence. Uh, Mad Magazine. I lived and breathed Mad Magazine growing up. Uh-huh. I had them all. I collected them. I poured over on them. I memorized them. Uh, and Warner Brothers cartoons, of course. Hanna Barbera cartoons. Tex Avery is the king. You know. Yep. Yep. Huge, huge influence on me. Chuck Jones, Bob Clampett, all the usual guys. You know. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Mad Magazine. Uh, you know, they had their iconic uh, character, Alfred E. Newman. What What did you uh, think about the difference between uh, Alfred E. Newman and uh, Sylvester P. Smith? I mean, did you like those guys as a kind of a, a competition, kind of, so to speak, for those two you know, magazines? It, I never I never worked with uh, Cracked. I never worked for Cracked. I never read Cracked. And I, I never even read Crazy. And then I ended up working for Crazy and... Uh, uh, the the icon the iconic character for Crazy was originally this guy called the Nebish. He was sort of a guy with a sort of a droopy looking hat and a big nose. And then uh, Larry Hama became the editor and he changed it to this character called Obnoxio the Clown, which I really liked. I thought he was pretty funny. He was just sort of like a cigar chomping, uh, whiskered, uh, really obnoxious clown. And um, uh, he was pretty cool. I liked him a lot. Uh, and it was it was great working on that magazine. I got to work with a lot of great cartoons. I learned a lot and get to do some pretty funny stuff. Like uh, for somebody who doesn't know what Craze Magazine was all about, like what were like some of the like some of the the features in the magazine? It it had all the same stuff as Mad Magazine movie parodies. That's what I did. I did the movie parodies. Oh. Uh, you know, there was a there was a guy who drew kind of like Don Martin, and you know they had. They did uh, Fumetti's, you know, photo comics. They did uh, uh, all everything you would see in Mad. They did the same thing, you mm-hmm. know. It's just they had a sli- slightly different style, but it was a lot like Mad in every way. And what were uh, like like after you got done doing the the Craze magazine? What was uh, like some of your first uh, like your your first cartoons that you actually got to work on when you started doing television? You know, I did. I think the first movie parody I did was a parody of Smokey and the Bandit. That would oh. give you an idea how long ago it was. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I did uh, I did a parody of Conan. I did I don't even remember it's been so long. I did a movie parody of Blade Runner, uh, uh, the first Star Trek movie. Um, I did a bunch of them, and I, they just kind of came and went so fast. I don't even remember all of them. Um, and every now and then I'll see somebody will post like one of the pages I did and I look at it I, I can tell I did it and it sort of looks familiar but I don't really remember doing it <laughs> I mean you know it was 1980 1981 it was probably a long time ago oh sure and, and, and nowadays it's like uh, uh, I suppose to produce like a magazine or even a comic book you know they, it's, uh, it's so different now than it used to be because uh, you know now everybody has digital technology to make it a little bit more e- easier than it used to be. Sure, sure, it's much e- much easier. I when I was working at Marvel, I picked up freelance and stuff. I did a lot of uh, paste up and layout, color separations and stuff. I did uh, I did some uh, assistant work for Mike Luda. I did a lot of assistant work for uh, Gary Halgren, the great Gary Halgren, great cartoonist uh, for for Larry Hama. Um, I did a lot of work on a lot of different things for people. They would just call me at the last minute. A lot of times there would be comics that uh, were running late, and they had to be inked overnight and then show up at Marvel with a bunch of other guys, and we would hang out all night, uh, you know, drink a coffee, eating pizza, and, uh, and ink an entire comic overnight. That was always a lot of fun. Did, 
you know. Did you get to ever meet uh, the great Stan Lee at all? You know what? Here's a funny story. I, I met him once a long time ago, but I was at uh, the Wizard Comic Con uh, over the weekend. Okay. And uh, um, the table next to mine, there was a gentleman there who was one of the Spider-Man artists, and Stan Lee but was standing next next to us, you know, talking to him. And he was, hi, how are you? And he was um, just a few feet away from me. And so I thought, wow, there's Stan Lee. So I'll go over and say hi. And so I'm standing behind Stan Lee, and he's shaking this other gentleman's hand, and he starts to back away. And uh, the guy had his stuff kind of stacked up behind him, and Stan's foot caught on the, some stacked up stuff, and he started to fall. Oh, wow. I saw I saw what was going to happen, so I just sort of reached over and kind of grabbed him by the elbow and pulled him around his back and stopped him from falling. Oh, sure. So uh, and I didn't talk to him, but he nodded at me and then walked away. So <laughs> I kept Stan Lee from falling over backwards. <laughs> that was you, kind of cool. You were his hero. <laughs> you yeah, saved but, the day. <laughs> you know, it was like one of those things that no one even noticed me doing. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm surprised he doesn't have, like, security or anything, or I suppose does he not need that, I suppose? There were a lot of people around. I mean, you know, everywhere Stan goes is fucking at him and smiling and following him and stuff like that, but, you know, he was sort of behind the tables uh, with the artist, so, you know, it was sort of away from the fans, and yeah. uh, uh, I just luckily happened to be right there to catch him by the arm. And he and he's up there in age too, and it's kind of surprising that he's just still still continues to do this. I mean, I don't know how much animation yeah. he does anymore, but I mean, just the fact that he's not in a nursing home or in a wheelchair, yeah, you know, it's kind I, of crazy. I think he's ninety three. Yeah, ninety two, ninety three. That's that's amazing. Uh, but he still seems pretty lively and and alert. And, you know, uh, I remember when I was working at Marvel, uh, he came in one day, and it must have been nineteen eighty three. And I said hello to him and shook his hand. And I thought, wow, this guy's really old. <laughs> that was way back then. 30 you know? years ago. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. He, he must be he must be uh, doing very well for himself in order to still be alert at 93. That's for sure. Because I see, like, well, when, they do, when they do those movies, like when he does the, the, the movies, uh, like the uh, Criminal Hulk or Spider-Man, or like when he does, like, the... Uh, uh, when he does his movies, or like when they do like mm -hmm. Spider Man or whatever, and he, and he has like a little part in, in it, you know, mm -hmm. just, a, just a small part, he always gets a chuckle. I always get a chuckle yeah. out of that. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It's great that he's still involved, you know. And and and, uh, and for you, uh, I I know that you worked uh, on the real Ghostbusters card, which uh, yeah. you got to work with uh, uh, a guy named Michael Gross. Does that sound familiar to you? Uh, he was he was uh, the producer of the show. Yeah, I know Michael, and I uh, worked for him a little bit on. I did some design work for the movie Twins. Yeah, and and, and he had a well. See, I I, I was uh, I interviewed him, or he was the last person that I interviewed prior to you. And, uh, <laughs> when I made the announcement that I was going to be interviewing you today on my Facebook page, he asked me to ask you a question about uh, a Twins T-shirt or something like that. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Tell a story if you can, because <laughs> I have no idea what, what you're talking the about. Uh, about the uh, twins T-shirt or something, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, what, um, there was a scene in the movie Twins where um, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito go into a Seven Eleven, and uh, there were some T-shirts on a rack, and so he he picks up a T-shirt and puts it on, and it says it's got a picture of a a screaming angry baby with a mohawk. Oh, yeah. And it says, born to be bad on the shirt. Uh-huh. I, I drew the t-shirt. It was my artwork on the t-shirt. Oh, wow. Okay. I remember that scene. Yeah. Because uh, what happened, I think, like, uh, they showed, like, a little parody of, like, Rambo or something like that, and, and, and the, the, the shirt ripped or whatever. <laughs> the, the old shirt that he had, or was this a new shirt that he had? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, anyway. I, yeah something like that. But what was cool is, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, I got to... Uh, Hang out on the lot, and I got to meet Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger and stuff. You know, <clears throat> I'm sure that was pretty um, fun for you. And I've worked on a few movies in, in my time, so uh, I spent a lot of time working on movie lots and uh, meeting people and going behind the scenes and on the sound stages and stuff. And that was always a lot of fun. So, what were some other notable films that you worked on besides uh, your cartoon stuff that we'll talk about after a bit? Uh, let me remember. Let me see. I worked <laughs> on uh, The Grinch. Okay. Uh, I worked on Cats and Dogs. 
uh, what else? I worked on Looney Tunes Back in Action. I worked on uh, Ice Age 2, Robots. Oh, wow. um, I worked on Osmosis Jones. Okay. Uh, I, worked, I worked on an ill-fated remake of uh, Incredible Mr. Limpet, which never got finished. Oh, okay. I uh, worked on um, an ill-fated uh, uh, sequel to uh, Space Jam, which never got done. Oh, wow. Uh, what else did I work on? God, I can't even remember. Um, I have to look at my, <laughs> have to look at my, uh, my filmography to uh, see what I get. But, you know, oh, off yeah. and on, I would do bits of work here and there. I did a little bit of uh, storyboarding for... Um, uh, Planet 51 uh, okay. or a movie that's still in production called Turkeys. Okay. Um, what else? I can't remember this. I know there's more. I just can't think of more. And, and what was your what was kind of like your job with most of these movies? Just being the animator or something like that? Or just being like storyboard guy? Story, storyboards, yeah. That's okay. pretty much what I do. I mean, I do direct still, but mostly I do storyboards. Oh, Okay. And, and that's like, and for those who don't know what storyboarding means, that's like getting some ideas together and putting them on a board of how we're going to do things, kind of. Or yeah, it's 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 you know it's a frame by frame uh, comic, if you will, of of a, of a movie or or a TV show, and uh, you work out all the the acting and the staging and and uh, the comedy and all that kind of stuff, and then that's take taken by the uh, store, the uh, animators and then they animate from that. Oh, cool. And, and I'm then, sitting here doing a storyboard as we speak, in fact. Oh, I, I thought you said you don't do a drawing while you're uh, <laughs> while you're not working, or unless you're still working. <laughs> I'm sitting here drawing while we're talking. Oh, wow. Oh, that's that's cool. That's cool. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and uh, most people know, and, I, and I, I didn't know this until I until I finally realized, because I was going through Facebook last night trying to send out some interview requests to, to see who I could interview next, and, and uh, before you agreed to do this interview, I, I looked up, you know, the fact that you did do the uh, the Rand Simpy cartoon, and you were a co-creator. How did that whole idea come to life, so to speak? The, uh, the idea uh, was the two characters were part of a show concept that uh, John Chris Lewis, he came up with called Your Gang, and it's something that he had developed when he was still in college. And <clears throat> he had, uh, we were sharing some uh, space, studio space, with a, a gentleman named Carl Masek, who's since passed away, but he was a very creative guy. He was a guy who uh, really brought uh, Miyazaki, you know, the great, Japanese animation director to the United States and, and brought uh, My Neighbor Totoro over and uh, was uh, getting it distributed. He had a company called Streamline Pictures and we were sharing studio with him and Jerry Beck, and I'm sure you know who Jerry Beck is. I believe so. Uh, felt the animation historian, he's written lots of books about Warner Brothers cartoons. So. Wow. And uh, we were sharing office space with him and uh, uh, Carl helped John get a meeting with Nickelodeon and they went in and he pitched some ideas and uh, Ren and Stippy were minor characters in this car cartoon called Your Gang, which was sort of a parody of Our Gang. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, the producer Vanessa Coffey said, "Hey, we really, we really like the uh, dog and cat. Let's do a show about the dog and cat." And the rest is history. We we did Ren and Stippy from that. And so, uh, working with John and uh, Jim Smith and Lynn Naylor, uh, we came up with the pilot for the show and. Everybody sort of pitched in and did a lot of stuff. I painted all the backgrounds, and we all wrote it together and storyboarded it and laid it out, and you know, sort of made a made a pilot. And then it ran on the uh, Spike and Mike Film Festival, the Animation Film Festival, and to a lot of uh, critical acclaim. And then we got picked up and did a series. Wow. Well, that that's pretty amazing. But how 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 did you be be the guy that uh, uh, co created it though? Like like. Did they just? Uh, did you team with somebody that else that uh, helped you come up with the idea, or was it just something you just thought about? Well, you know, I mean, I'm in in as much as I'm the co-creator because I was there, you know, and it wasn't a show before, and and uh, you know, the four of us 
uh, put our heads together and came up with a show and created it together. So that, you know, okay, uh, we're co- co-creators of the show. Wow. Oh, that's that's pretty cool. And I, I gotta tell you, I, I you know watch a lot of episodes of Red and Sippy. I don't know if I've seen the whole series of it, but I know I've seen the majority of her, uh, of of the series. My a friend of mine actually got uh, bought one of the DVD sets that just came out not too uh, a well a while ago, and we watched and had some laughs and everything. And and to me, it kind of reminds me almost like a, a you know, almost like uh, it's more or less a not just a, a cartoon for kids, but more or less uh, more adult related humor. Almost like Beavis and Butthead, kind of like. Yeah, well, the thing is, is we, you know, we had all worked in animation for a while and, and had worked on a lot of shows that uh, weren't particularly funny and we didn't really like and we weren't allowed to write, you know, because they always had writers. And we always felt like we were funnier and better writers <laughs> than the writers. And so, sure. you know, we had an opportunity to make our own cartoon and write it ourselves. So it was, you know... Uh, uh, the kids, kids let loose in the candy store. We sort of went nuts and came up with a lot of as weird, weirder stuff as we could <laughs> come up with, you know. And uh, we sort of made Rinus to be for ourselves. I mean, it was on a kids' network; it was for kids, but really, we made it for ourselves. We we did what made us laugh and what we thought was funny. And luckily for us, uh, Nickelodeon was a bit naive, and we sort of uh, didn't really realize what we were doing at the time, <laughs> and uh, so. So we, we did get away with murder. But, you know, I think it's all good. And I run into people every day that say, hey, you know, you really helped shape my childhood and helped me develop my sense of humor. Oh, and, sure. Uh, sure. So, you know, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I, I think if people censor what kids see too much and people are naive about what kids see. I mean, if if most parents knew what their kids are looking at on the Internet, they they drop dead. I'm sure. You know? uh. No, and, and, and you had a, you had a good run too with with Beavis and Bu- or not Beavis and Butter with Red and Stimpy. I mean, it wasn't just a show that just lasted for like one season. It, it lasted for what four or five seasons, about. Yeah, yeah, we we did the full the full run. Uh, yeah, we ran from nineteen ninety is when we did the pilot through ninety five is when we finished yeah. the series. So that's something to be proud of, that it never got canceled or anything. Kind of like uh, how, how Family Guy was canceled like one or two times, and then they brought it back because fans loved it, so that's why they keep it going. And, and too bad they couldn't yeah. do like a re version of Ren and Stimpy, like bring it back to to today's generation, you know, some new episodes. Well, they, they, did, they did some new ones a while back that oh. I had nothing to do with. Okay, okay. Adult, adult Party Cartoon is what it was called, and it oh. was... Uh, it was very, very different right instead of Oh, okay. I, I uh, guess I never I, seen that. I had nothing to do with those. Okay, things. okay. Yeah, but but that's so cool though. I mean, you know, that's well, that's why you fit to, to be on the show because you, you know, whether people remember who you are or they don't, you've done a lot of things that are iconic with pop culture, and Red and Simpy, even uh, even uh, the merchandise line, you know, of Red and Simpy. I mean. That's cool. I mean, to come up with ideas for shirts and cups and and caps and all types of doohickeys here and there. I think if anything, you know, people will remember Be- or uh, Ren simply you know, also because of the cool merchandise you guys uh, uh, sold and stuff. Yeah, they really didn't merchandise it much. I mean, I remember that um, uh, the people in charge sort of felt like that, you know, over merchandising it sort of cheapened it, and and they were they, you know. Jolene Laybourne, I remember she really didn't like the idea of, of merchandising things too much. Oh, sure. I think, uh, and we we kind of felt like you guys did more, but you know, it was the, it was her network. Yeah, that's what she wanted. I mean, at the same time, they were doing this. They had started The Simpsons. And they were merchandising the hell out of that. Yeah, you know, they still minute, do. Look at these guys, look how much stuff they got. Yeah. I mean, it was some cool. There was some cool stuff, but not a lot. So, like, uh, like, like. At- at your own home, like in your own personal collection, do you have like all the old tapes that you uh, of of, of uh, Ren Simpy and all the the works that you've done, like on DVD or Blu-ray or anything, or on uh, yourself? No, I have. I do have tapes in uh, boxes in the attic. Okay. Uh, I have a lot of uh, tapes on uh, three-quarter inch tape, but I don't even have a three-quarter inch player. I wouldn't even know where to find one. <laughs> uh, they're they're sort of obsolete. Uh, and I do have a VHS player, but um, I don't have the DVD set, and I'll tell you why. Uh, when when the DVD set came out, uh, 
I not only didn't know about it, but I wasn't told about it. Oh. And I was in Blockbuster one day, and I looked down on the shelf, and I saw Rain of Snippy DVDs. And I picked them up like, what the hell? And I looked at them and flipped them over, and it said with director's commentary. So, uh, as you may well imagine, I was pretty pissed off because yeah. not only did I not even get a free copy, um, they uh, let John do the director's commentary on all my cartoons after he'd been fired. And so he, you know, was doing commentary on cartoons he had nothing to do with. And I wasn't even given the chance to do commentary on my own cartoons. So wow. uh, I, I don't own that because I refuse to own it. And when people, a lot of times people come up and bring stuff for me to sign at conventions. And when people bring me the DVD set, I go, okay, I'll sign your DVD, but I want you to know that I don't approve of this DVD, I had nothing to do with it, and I tell them that story because I think they should know. Oh wow, yeah, that, that's a, definitely an, an interesting story because, well, that's kind of that kind of sucks, you know, that they would let you uh, or give you a chance because you're a co-creator. I mean, you're <laughs> you you help you yeah. you helped uh, start a revolution as far as the Red and Simbi revolution goes, and God, yeah, that that's did you ever find out why they never uh, got a hold of you at all? Uh, because John had John K had uh, control over it. Oh. And so he he you know, on purpose didn't include me. Huh. So, yeah. Well what That's about all I'll say about that. What about <laughs> what about with the real Ghostbusters though? I mean did because uh, since you had a you were uh, what were what was your role in that again? You were uh, I was the I was the character designer. Okay. Was, uh me and uh, Bruce Kim were designing all the characters. Did they give you uh, access to like the, D- the the DVD box set when it came out and stuff? Like, told you about it and everything, and did interviews with you? Because I don't own it at all. No, I just own the no, first volume. I didn't. I didn't, I don't have those either. But you know, the thing about it is, is that uh, I was a kind of a minor player in that. You know, I was just a character designer. I was a I was a young guy. It was one of my first animation jobs. Uh-huh. It wasn't like I was, you know a creator of the show or anything. Oh. Uh, I mean, if I wanted to, I could go buy the set. <laughs> you know, I could get them. Well, I, I think it doesn't matter. I think uh, if you if you had any... I don't care if you were the guy who just uh, 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 threw out the trash. I mean, if you had something to do with a, a, a put-together production, I mean, I think you should be uh, 100% involved. You know, they should get the whole crew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I th- you know what? It's It's corporations, they don't really, you know... They don't really worry too much about the little guys. Huh. Uh, they're they're more involved in just making money, and uh, you know, artists are usually when a production's over, when a TV show's over, artists are the first people to go. Wow. Like thank and great bye, and you're gone. <laughs> Jeez, it's kind of funny. Yeah. I guess you would never, you never would think that. I guess you know, in the world of animation, because they always make it sound it's like it's the funnest job in the world, but they don't tell you like the stuff you're telling me today. All the secrets and you know it's behind the scenes, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's, it's you know it's not it's not always fun. It can be fun, you know. Yeah. Uh, it depends on where you work and who you work with and stuff. But uh, it's you know it's it's uh, it's a there's way worse ways to make a living, you know. Uh, but it, it can be a tough business. Too. And you also worked on another favorite cartoon of mine, the uh, Tiny Toon Adventures. And what was your role in that? I was a storyboard artist. Okay. And on, yeah. on the whole series, or just uh, a few episodes? Uh, I was on that for some months. Uh, I was one of the first people I hired. But, uh, at, at one point, I got pretty disillusioned with the whole process and oh. the cartoon. I didn't like it very much. And uh, that was about the time that uh, we uh, I got together with, with John and those guys. And started Spunko started our studio, so okay. we kind of okay. grew out of that. So you never had anything to do with that uh, one movie that they came out with, How I Spent My Summer Vacation? No. Okay, okay. And I, I wasn't sure, because I don't... I, I, I am the type of guy who loves to, you know, sit for the opening credits, and especially the ending credits of a movie or TV show, no matter what it is. Uh, a lot of people don't like to do that, but I like doing that, because I like the, the music, and I like to see who, who all is involved, so... Uh, it's just uh, amazing, I guess, sometimes all the people that it takes to make a movie or, or a cartoon or whatever. You know, it's all magic, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> so, uh, you work for Warner Brothers right now, right? That's your current job? No. No? No, I'm working at Nickelodeon. 
Oh, you work at I'm Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon right now. Oh, okay, because uh, your Facebook it said you worked at Warner Brothers. I used to work at Warner Brothers, okay. but I don't work there anymore. Yeah. Okay, so Nickelodeon. So uh, can you uh, talk about any upcoming projects that you're working on at all that we could expect? Um, I'm, I'm working on uh, um, a preschool show called Bubble Guppies. <clears throat> it's a pretty good show. It just won me an Emmy for the best um, preschool show. Oh, wow. Okay. That's on Nick, is it on Nick Jr.? or Probably? Yeah. Or? Okay. Okay. That's what I'm doing right now. Okay. Uh, I'm the I'm the storyboard supervisor on the show. Big up. No really huge, big uh, cartoons coming up at all yet uh, for Nickelodeon at all, huh? Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I'm not really sure what to I'm just sitting here doing this right now. Uh, I'm going to be doing this for probably another month, and then I'm uh, going to be uh, probably working for uh, Illumination. There they do. Okay. Despicable Me. You know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. I haven't signed the paperwork yet, but I'm in talks with them right now about working for them. So you're down in Florida, then I suppose. Uh, is that where the? It's- mm-hmm. No, no, I'm in New York City, Times Square. I'm oh, so they don't... Out of went, uh, Times Square right now. Oh, wow, okay. See, see, I, I, I forget that uh, you, Nickelodeon Studios used to be in Florida and all that stuff, so they, I, I forgot that they moved. <laughs> That's well, that was, You know, that, was, that wasn't the, the animation end of it, more or less. That was more just the... Yeah. Okay, okay. I guess I get a little confused, I guess, because, you know, it's when times have changed so much, and it's just, it's a different world we live in now, you know, with everything, and, but, uh, it's still, uh, I, I still appreciate the fact of you being on, uh, being a guest of mine, this has been a lot of fun, sure. uh, you are definitely, uh, an iconic figure no matter what, uh, uh, your, your, your passes, and, uh, it's just great to have you on, and thank you for just doing what you do. Well, thanks a lot, it's been fun talking to you. You have a great one, and, uh, I'll let you know when I post this interview. Okay, great, and and thanks a lot. All right, man. Take care. Bye. Uh-huh. And that was Bob Camp, and uh, you got to learn a lot about his uh, life and career as an animator, storyboard artist, character designer, and you know, just uh, all around good guy. You know, just uh, uh, some, a guy who's trying to make a living, just uh, doing the uh, doing the ultimate dream when it comes to. Uh, being a uh, an animator and stuff, and, and you've heard now you got to hear the the ups and the downs, and it's kind of sad that there are any downs. You know, you would figure that there wouldn't be with uh, animation, but you know what? I guess that that's just the real world part of it. I guess, and uh, you know, but no matter what, even if I was an animator, even though I can't draw worth shit, uh, if I was an animator, I I would uh, I would definitely be proud of everything that I I was able to do, regardless of what any. A uh, big company thought about me, or a corporation thought about me as a whole, you know, just because I got to do all these cool things, you know. So, and now uh, you know what these interviews are. That, that's probably as <laughs> as cool as it gets for me in my end, anyway. That I've been able to do this for as long as I have. But uh, anyway, I just uh, want to say thank you for uh, uh, just hanging out with uh, with me again uh, for another great interview, and uh, we'll see you again for. Another great interview on Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture right all summer long, and I'm thinking that we're probably going to expand it through September uh, just because there's some guests that I still want to talk to that I haven't had a chance to talk to yet, uh, like James Hampton, because he uh, he uh, had surgery on his mouth and all that, so he, he said we have to wait on the interview for a little bit. But, but you never know when that will be, and I don't know when that will be. It was supposed to be in June, but it probably won't be until late July or early or August or maybe in September, but it hopefully will be sometime this year anyway. He promised that we could do it, so uh, whether I'm, uh, well, I won't be in South, uh, I won't be in Minnesota too much longer. Uh, pretty soon I'm going to be moving to uh, South Dakota, uh, but I'll explain that, or if I've already explained it in a video already, I will let you guys know more about that here soon. But anyway, Frank Slauson, and thanks for tuning in to another great Frankie's Icons of Pop Culture summer interview. Bye-bye.